Well, hey, wait, when you're on your feet, on your feet for the king, let's do this. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to sing. And I will praise you all my days. You're perfect and know your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. And I will obey your word. I want to see your kingdom come. Not my will, but yours be done. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. Oh, how wonderful you are. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. And how powerful you are. How powerful you are. Glory, glory to the Lamb. Glory, glory. Oh, you take me into the land. We will conquer in your name. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. <laughs> hail, hail, line of Judah. How wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. And how powerful you are. How powerful oh, come on. Glory, glory to the Lamb. You take me into the land. Well, we will conquer in your name. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. Come on. Oh, hail, hail, Lion of Judah. How wonderful you are. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. How powerful you are. Lord, how powerful you are. How powerful you are. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise to God. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. <clears throat> Hallelujah. One king, one worthy one, one, one king. You have also one father. And we are all brothers. I have the love in my heart as a father, but that comes from the father. For you, I have that love for you as a grandfather to many of you. <laughs> Many of you are precious daughters to me. Others, precious sisters to me. But we all have one father. Call no man your father on earth. For one is your father and that is God. And you are all brethren. The worthy one, Jesus Christ. He is our focus. Would you go with me to John chapter 5? And then we'll go from there. Back to Genesis, right to the very beginning of the Bible. Some of you will hear things you've heard from me before. Please endure it for the sake of others who have not. We are seeking always to make the case that this book should be treated like a book where we start at one end and we work our way through it, that it is not a buffet where you go down the line at a buffet and say, a little of this and maybe some of that, none of this and some of this other. It is your menu. It's your diet. I probably told some of you about something I only learned about just a couple of years ago on my way here. I know American history fairly well, but there was something I missed from American history. 
that I was exposed to at the Museum of the Bible in our nation's capital. It's a museum worthy of a visit. I wanted to visit because I love the word. But if I have to be really honest, I also wanted to hear my own voice um, at the museum. For I had a part in one exhibit. I got to narrate. And, uh, and if, you, if you were to visit the Museum of the Bible and you put on the virtual reality goggles, you can have a simulation experience as if you've gone to Israel. And you're looking at the land of the Bible. And there's a voice in your ear going, the Sea of Galilee. That's me. I wanted to hear it. So I heard it. Big deal. Now I wanted to go visit the Bible. And they have in the Museum of the Bible, they have a, a replica of a Gutenberg printing press. You see, the entire world was experiencing what we still rightly refer back to as the Dark Ages. It was a millennium characterized by ignorance, a millennium of illiteracy. It was a millennium where what was called Christendom became very unbiblical and very superstitious. It came to an end with a period that the historians refer to as the Age of Enlightenment. But the Age of Enlightenment was really the result of a revival in literacy, a revival in reading, and the availability of books to common people. In the ancient world, only the rich could afford books because all books were handwritten and then hand copied. But in 1455, with the invention of the Gutenberg Press, books became available to regular people like us, not just for the rich. And then shortly thereafter, the Bible was translated into the language of the common people. Well, once that happened, Reformation took place. The knowledge of God's word, once again, began to explode and be disseminated all over the world. It is what gave birth to America. It was a reformation, a spiritual revival that caused displaced people to seek out a land where they could live what they understood from divine revelation. Unfortunately, along with those who sought for religious freedom. There were those who just sought for riches. And along with the Bible, also the practice of slavery. Now, throughout the history of the world, every member of the family tree has been enslaved at one time or another. Most recently, it was the African enslaved by the British Empire. And the Americans, at least the southern states, brought that. I became aware at the Museum of the Bible of, of something called the Slave Bible. I had never heard of it. I would later discover that it started in England. But it was brought to America. Now, what is the Slave Bible? Well, the Slave Bible is a heavily redacted version of the Bible. Now consider this, all you in this room who happen to be ministers of God's word, imagine the presumption that some would have to have in order to determine we want people to know some of this book, but not all of it. Now that would truly be a wicked heart a wicked and evil heart that would say, we want people to know some, but not all. <laughs> we want them to know enough to be good, submissive slaves. 
We don't want them to know about God's people being set free from their slavery. They didn't want the people who would serve as their slaves to know about Moses, to know about God sending a deliverer. (laughs) So they presumed to subtract from the Bible. The slave Bible had all of those verses included that would say, slaves, obey your masters in the Lord. But no exodus. There's a whole lot missing from the slave Bible. Now, wouldn't you agree with me that that is wicked? To presume to take from the Bible. It's outrageous. It makes me mad every time I think about it. I get angry at the thought that some group of so-called scholars would presume to go through the book and take pages from it to make it available. Now my question to you, my fellow ministers, is what version of the slave Bible do you have? Which portions have you not proclaimed? Which portions have you presumed were not worthy to be made known to God's people? That is the common practice in modern preaching. For someone to have their favorite portions of Scripture, (laughs) the great A.W. Tozier warned that there is a little heretic in every one of us. And he said, you can tell that by the way we frequent and even underline portions of the Scripture as if what's on either side of what we frequent or what is on either side of what we underline is any less relevant to our life. We're all prone to it. (laughs) We are prone to act like children and want the sugar without the meat or without the vegetables. Christians, unfortunately, in this modern age, are malnourished. And they live on some kind of spiritual candy, brain candy, spirit candy, feel good, tickle you kind of preaching. Our obligation as God's ministers, I say this to those of you in the room who are pastors, is to make known the whole counsel of God, all of it, and to never presume to remove anything or maybe just skip over it. Let us not. John chapter 5. Now for the purposes of this gathering, for the purpose of my few days with you, I can't dig in as deep and I cannot spend as long or cover as much. But my objective, and I again I ask for your patience, those of you who have heard me preach through the first three or four chapters of Genesis before, please put up with it again. Because I'm just trying to demonstrate something very important and that there is a consistent revelation of a person (laughs) along with a whole lot of wisdom in the scriptures. John chapter 5, in an exchange with the religious leaders, the Son of God himself. Said in John chapter 5, verse 39, surge the scriptures. For in them you think you'll have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, says the Son of God. So I would ask you if somebody on the street was to ask you, what is the Bible about? And you were forced to summarize your answer with one word. That word should be the name, Yeshua, Jesus. Now there's a lot in here. There's a lot in this book. 
the, uh, the explanation of our origin, where we came from. Where are we going? Why are we here? There's so much wisdom. There is so much for us to learn. But if you were to summarize with one word, what is this book about? The name Jesus should be your answer. For it is the name that reveals to us the love of God, the plan of God, the glory of God, the might, oh, the wisdom, the, the genius of God. It's all in that name, in, in that person. So since it is the Son of God himself who tells us to search the Scriptures and tells us that the Scriptures testify of him, let's go back to the very beginning. Go with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I will say again, I've got to do this faster than normal. I've got to summarize portions in order to get to the main and most important points. If we had the time, I would, as your pastor does, just focus on a chapter per gathering. Let's just digest that chapter. Let's chew it. Let's consume it. Let's um, savor it. Meditate upon it. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now that opening line reveals to us that God is one, and at the same time he is more than one. The use of the word Elohim, Elohim, it's the im or the end of a Hebrew word that makes it plural. Just as it is an S or an ES at the end of an English word that makes it plural. God uses a word that is plural, but then he puts that word with a singular verb. So the noun is plural, Elohim. But the verbs connected to the noun's actions, plural. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. So the very first indication we have that God is one and yet he is more than one. That the Godhead is understood and revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three in one, one in three. You can spend a lot of um, valuable brain cells trying to understand the Trinity, and you never will. You'll only hurt your brain. But in the words of Martin Luther, in regard to the doctrine of the Trinity, try to understand it, you could lose your mind, but deny it, and you could lose your soul. For it is not a question of what we can understand. It is a question of what God has revealed. What does he say about himself? What does he reveal about himself? He reveals that he is one and yet he's more than one. And he reveals it all the way through, especially in the count of creation. What did he create? Verse 1 tells us, in the beginning, that is time. Elohim created the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. Time, space, matter, continuum. The very universe itself reflects the triunity of God who created it. And each of those, whether you're talking about space measured in three primary dimensions or matter known in three primary states, liquid, solid, vapor, or time, known to us who are within it is past, present, and future. They themselves are triune. The triunity of God is reflected in the universe that he created. We have here the very next words in verse 2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Spirit of God moved. He created and then he moved. He energized. He set everything into motion that moves. 
Hmm. He is the prime mover. He moved. Interesting thing about this, by the way, is that every single form of energy that we as humans have been able to understand and measure, all energy is moving in waves. Waves are actually implied by the Hebrew text. It is the very word moved. It can be translated hovered or shook, vibrated. The Hebrew word indicates motion and waves. He is the prime mover and everything that moves, moves because he initiated it. Now, I wish we could dig into every single verse, but for the sake of our purpose, let me just read the verses, beginning in verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide between the waters from the waters. God made the firmament, divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. In the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Can I point out to you? that at each stage of creation, God said. This agrees with divine revelation from the New Testament that everything was made by what God said, the very logos of God created, the very word of God. God said, <laughs> let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let there be Lights in the firmament of the heaven that divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There's a progression. Then it all starts in a state of chaos and, and disorder. And then God sets about ordering it. God sets about taking it from one level of good to another level of better. In each stage, it is good. God said it's good. Verse 19, the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Verse 20, God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly. The moving creatures that hath life, the fowl, that may fly upon the earth and the open firmament of heaven. God created the whales and every living creature that moveth 
which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. And every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters and the seas. Let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. God blessed. God blessed and God commanded every living thing he made to make life, to reproduce. Then verse 24 says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures. The living creature after his kind, cattle, and creeping thing, beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, friends, God said, let us, within the counsels of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the determination was that man would be made in the image of God. The determination was that man would be made in God's likeness. And God said, let us. Verse 27, so God created man. In his own image, in the image of God, created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them. God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God blessed them. God created them with the capacity to make life happen. And he blessed them with a command. Very simple command. Make life happen. Within our kind, God connected the act of making life to love. Oh, we are so different from all of the animals, despite the, the new state religion in the West. The truth is, the great distance between you and the animals is enormous. Many of our educational systems have told us lies. They told us lies and they told us that we evolved. They gave us another whole version and the most wicked thing that anybody attempted to do was take that version of pagan thought about creation and that is the theory of evolution and then try to connect it to God in theistic evolution. It's a lie from hell. It is neither scientific nor is it biblical. We have the record of scripture Divine revelation reveals to us that God created in six days. He did exactly what he said. There is no evolution. Evolution, we'll see, when we get into chapter three, was introduced by an angel, Lucifer, who said, I will ascend. I will become like the Most High. That concept in the mind of Lucifer has become state religion in most Western countries. And it has been fed to every level of our educational system. And it's not scientific. It's not provable. It's the theory of evolution. But it is taught 
in our institutions is if it were a proven fact. It's not a fact. It's a lie. Now we have here the truth that God created us in his image. And by the way, may I also point out to you that evolution as a religion and as a false and pseudoscience has been used against you Africans. It has historically been used against you. That devil, Adolf Hitler, dedicated his thesis, Mein Kampf, to Darwin. He came up with a notion that his um, particular branch of the human family tree was more human than others. It's a lie. There's no such thing. Every single human being is created in the image of God and are valuable. But if you believe the foolishness of evolution, the wickedness of that false religion, and by the way, let me point out to you while I'm at it, that all the false religions in this world have evolution as their core. All of them are various forms of evolution. All the false religions and all of the false Christs of the false religions, all of them ascend. They work their way up. They're becoming something more. And they offer to you a theory about how you can work your way up. Contrast that with the true Christ who came down. The true Christ, the real Christ, the true living God stepped into creation. He came down. His own words in John chapter 6, the bread of life, the bread from heaven, is he who came down to give life to the world. The apostle Paul goes on about this. Who is this one who ascended? He's one who first descended. You understand? He came down to us. He came down here to get us. He came to reveal himself to us. Oh, the glory of the incarnation is my favorite fascination. I don't know, next to the wonder of the atonement. Oh. Uh, you, uh, you're familiar with a pit latrine. You're familiar with a hole in the ground full of human waste, yes? <laughs> and hopefully there's a hole not large enough for you to fall into. I am well acquainted with the pit latrine. Imagine the horror of a pit latrine that has collapsed and someone you love is falling into it. Is that not a horrible thought? Dreadful thought? Of course, I guess maybe it depends on who has fallen in. Perhaps you have someone you wish would fall in. You should not. <laughs> what if it were the object of your love? What if it were the child that you bore? What if it were the bride that you won? What if it was the groom that won you? And they've fallen in. They've fallen in and it's over their head. Would you go in after them? I submit to you that God himself went in after us. He came in after us. He didn't just throw us a rope. He came in after us. And in, in more than that, in, in, the, in the incarnation, he became one of us. He came all the way down here. Take upon himself human flesh for the very purpose of dying for us. Imagine him diving in and then the only way to save you from drowning in it is he has to absorb it into himself. As the scriptures say, 
God made him to be sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And even that lame attempt of mine to illustrate some of the incarnation and the atonement fails. It falls short. It's more glorious than that. It's more extreme than any such picture I could paint for you with words. Let me just say again, you're no animal. Do we have a few things in common with the other creatures that God created that are animals? Yes, we do. Remarkably, we have two eyes. So do most of them. That, that allows us to triangulate and determine depth. We have two ears. Likewise, it allows us to triangulate sound at its source. We have a lot in common with those the animals, the foolish evolutionists, they think we're predators because our eyes are forward. And in the created world, in the animal kingdom, everything is equipped to either be predator or prey. And all the predators have forward-facing eyes because they're on offense. And all of the prey have 360 degree vision with eyeballs mounted on the sides because they have to be on guard. They are on defense. But this whole arrangement is God's doing. You're not an animal, you're not a predator, nor are you created to be prey. Let's consider how different you are from the animals before we read on. You're made in the image of God. You are a biped. You walk on two feet, you walk upright. Why? Well, I'll tell you now, that wasn't the result of evolution because it made us slower than all the four-legged animals, except for the tortoise. It made us less stable. I have... A dog, I always have a dog, it's a large dog, a dangerous dog. And he does my job for me when I'm not home. But we spend time together and anytime I see that dog slip and fall, I mock him. Because he's got four legs. He has no excuse for falling. <laughs> it only takes three points to establish a plane and so whenever he does fall, I mock him. Why are we on two feet? Why? Because we are created for two realms, this earth and for heaven. Yes, we are, in fact, attached to both of them. We are created to walk on the surface of the earth and look above it all and look past it all to something greater. More about that in a few minutes, but look, look at this. Oh, and one more thing. Let me point, this, forgive me. I don't, let me get medical for just a moment, if I may. The secularist is so busy telling us how much we're just like the chimpanzee. And they say ridiculous things that are not true, like you are 98% the same as a chimpanzee. A, that's not true, that's a lie. And B, even if it were true, it's irrelevant. That 2% difference, which they themselves acknowledge, is a massive amount of information. You, let me tell you something about you males. Your reproductive organ, unlike all of the animals, does not have a bone, it's not part of your skeletal structure, it is with them. Or well, maybe that's news to you, I don't, maybe you didn't know that. But it happens to be connected to your heart. It is hydraulic, and it's about the flow of blood. And blood, my friend, is a serious substance, and it makes our whole design a serious 
business. We're not in animals, and therefore we must not live like animals. Your culture, like my now post-Christian culture in America, has men living like animals, just obeying urges. Like a dog, like a chimpanzee. Just acting on impulses and urges. That's not what we were created to be. We created in the image of God. And our heart should be involved in the process of making life. In the process of making love. But there is so little heart involved. And in the reality of the sin-cursed culture you and I are living in, women are exploited by men. Used. Manipulated. More about that later. But hold that thought. If there is a man in this room who is guilty of sexual immorality, if you're a man who cannot be faithful to one woman, if you're a man who uses women, and you manipulate them, and you know how to flatter, you know how to flirt, you know how to make them feel like they're special in order to get something from them, you better repent because you're in trouble with God. Now, back to the subject. Here, God made us in his image. you got to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that explains so much about what we are, how we are. We're spiritual beings. We're made in his image, in his likeness. God blessed. God gave him a command. You could summarize that command with, make life. <laughs> and for us, that means... Make love and make life. Love each other and let life come from that love. That's how it's supposed to work. That's the command that God gave. That is the blessing that he pronounced. Now we go just a couple of verses past that and we'll have chapter one behind us. Verse 30, uh, verse 29 Oh, by the way, let me, let me mention this, please. Verse 28 speaks of the dominion that God gave us over the animals. May I also point out to you and urge you to, to study for yourself the eighth psalm. Psalm 8, which we don't have time to do tonight, describes the exalted yet humbled place of man. A dual reality is proclaimed in Psalm 8. That man has been given a dominion, and yet he's small, he's humble. The psalmist cries out to God, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou dost visit him? Behold, thou hast made man a little lower than the angels, but gave him a dominion over the animals. And that's described in the 8th Psalm. Lower than the angels, higher than the animals. There's an irony here, and please understand this. There are two realms, the material realm, which was created by the spiritual realm. Spirit is eternal, matter is temporary and temporal. Humans are made of both. That's a unique place for humanity. Lower than the angels, but higher than the animals, for now, I proclaim to you that the plan of God in redemption takes us to a higher place, takes us, when the whole program of God is done, to a place where we share space with the angels. But on earth, we rule and reign with Christ. The Apostle Paul says in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, don't you know who you are, you Christians? Don't you know that the saints will one day rule the world? will judge the world. Don't you know that you will one day judge angels even? The picture we have in heaven is a beautiful picture in the book of Revelation. And in it, 
We have our song and the angels have their song and we trade off singing. It's beautiful. Lower than the angels, higher than the animals. Read on. Verse 29. God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is born, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit. Uh, of a tree yielding seed. And to you, it shall be for meat. I got to tell you, Josh, my hesitancy is because of the dark spots worn by my finger holding my place. Preaching this text all over the world, I've smudged my print. It's not that I'm old and can't see that well. Alone. But it's my page has been well worn. Verse 30, to every beast of the field and to every fowl of the air and every creeping thing upon the earth wherein the, there is life. I have given every green herb for meat and it was so. So every single green herb was for food. Even for the animal kingdom, it was paradise. It was. It will be again. It will be again, ladies and gentlemen. Listen, I want to proclaim something to you that you might not know. You are from the most amazing piece of real estate on earth. You are from a land that is rich with minerals, rich with gold and diamonds. You've, you, you are, are from a land and a climate that will grow food if it's just managed. Hunger is not because this land is inadequate. It is only always human greed and gross mismanagement. That's right, it's government. Just for the record, hunger is not God's fault, and hunger is not a failure of his design. You've been lied to about the population of the world and whether or not the world can sustain it. You've been lied to. You and I are being lied to about so many things. <laughs> the spirit of Antichrist at work in the world has fed a new false religion with regard to climate and man-made climate change. I tell you, it's a lie. Your president ought to be informed. Because apparently he's fallen for it. It is a lie. It is only an unrealistic fear that is being manipulated and translated into power that pulls the world together to deal with what is supposedly a global threat. It's a lie. It is a lie. You can fit the entire population of Earth. Do you know this? Based on the size of people, because we're kind of small, in relation to the size of our planet, the entire population of Earth can fit within just the state of Texas. And everybody can have 250 square yards of his own space to manage. We don't have a population problem. We don't have a space problem. We got a sin problem. Just thought I'd mention it. God made a paradise and the green things fed everything and it will be restored under the reign of Christ our King. It will be restored. Have you read those prophecies from Isaiah? They talk about the wolf and the lamb lying down together and the lion eating grass like an ox. You know what you need for that to happen? Way better grass. And you know who's going to bring that about? The creator himself. He returns second time. He returns as a man. Now, brothers, sisters, we live in a different world than this one that was created. It's different, but it's been so altered. Altered by sin. 
And in this world, I want to point out to you, it was God, it was God who said, I've given you the animals to eat as well. Post-worldwide flood, environmental changes, it's the creator who introduced meat to our diet. And for this, I'm very grateful. <laughs> I love this arrangement. But it's not permanent. There is a time coming when we will all, even like the ox, return to eating vegetation, and the vegetation will be so good. We're not going to mind it. Don't think of a thousand years of salad. It'll be a thousand years in which we have never eaten so well. The reign of Christ on the earth. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I'm thinking about it right now. I believe when that day comes, when, when those prophecies are fulfilled, when men will beat their swords into the plowshares and their spears into the pruning hooks. Isaiah prophesies this, when we can redirect all our energies into just growing and enjoying food and eating together. Now we're talking about a good time. All the energies of humanity, which are right now devoted to war, one day be devoted to party, eating, bar no, not barbecue. Well, we yeah, barbecue, but we'll be barbecuing produce, not salad. We will barbecue produce that is better than the choicest piece of meat we know now. I'm telling you, brothers, ladies, I've been thinking about this a long time. I believe we will grow sausage on the vine. Steak on trees. <laughs> the whole world was fed by the green herb. I, I, just for the record, I think what I have, I, I, I eat mostly meat, almost exclusively. <laughs> now, in my way of thinking, it's really a plant-based diet. That's the popular thing right now. It's sort of a plant-based diet thing. Well, when you really stop and think it through, we feed the vegetables to the cow, and he processes it for us, and we eat the cow. It's, it's a plant-based diet. I mean, it starts with a plant. It ends with a steak. But back to the subject. Ah, I'm going to wrap this one up. So chapter one is nearly behind us. Verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. Not just good. It was way good. Very good. Oh, I love this. This is, this is a book that doesn't exaggerate. So sometimes it seems like things are understated. It's so good. It's not just good, it's very good. When you think about this, when you think about the fact that the Son of God says, good means perfect, what is very good? <laughs> it's way perfect. It was good at every stage of creation. Each of creation's days end with God going, it's good. The next day is gooder. It's just one level of good to another. And then we'll come to chapter two where we'll find something that is not good. And that is man being alone. God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. Oh, I wish we had all night. I do. I'm sure you've sat about as long as you're willing to sit. But let me just tell you, Christ, who said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. It is they that testify of me. He is there. In Genesis chapter one, as a matter of fact, 
I'll leave you with the way the Apostle John summarizes Genesis chapter 1 in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. How you say it? Was the word. In the beginning was the word. <laughs> and, the, and the word was God. So word and God rhyme. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. Wrap your brain around that one and you'll hurt it. You'll hurt your brain. He is God. There's no question about the divinity of Jesus Christ. Anyone who denies his divinity is of the spirit of Antichrist. Was that said loud enough? The triunity of God cannot be denied from the text here open before us. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is God and He's with God. Yeah, man. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That means he isn't made. Without him was nothing made that was made. He, Christ, is unmade. He's always been. You get that? Do you hear me? I'm saying that for the benefit of somebody who doesn't get it or who has denied it, you need to repent. He, the Son of God, is God the Son. Everything that was created was created by him. Without him was nothing created. Means he is not created. Every cult that comes down the pike, every cult that enters, every, especially every Christian deviation cult, always deviate on the Trinity. And connected to that is the divinity of the God-man. Man, I love that term. The God man. He made everything. Nothing was made that he didn't make. He is not made. He has always been. Eternally begotten of God the Father. In him, verse 4 says, was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. You skip down to verse 12. I'm sorry. <clears throat> skip down to verse. Oh, man. You can't really skip anything. It's all too awesome. But my time is up, and I'm cutting into overtime. Have you ever... Notice the very last thing you read in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. There's an exchange between two guys. I'll leave you with this. Two guys. One of them is Philip. The other is named Nathan. Nathaniel. Philip and Nathaniel. Philip comes to believe the Messiah has arrived. So he goes looking for his buddy, Nathaniel. He's looking for his buddy, Nathaniel. And Nathaniel is out in the middle of nowhere. He's out on some hillside under a fig tree alone. You know what's going on with Nathaniel? Nathaniel's out there under that fig tree, wondering, asking, crying out to the sky, crying out to God. He's asking. What connection is there from heaven to earth? Where is this bridge from heaven to earth that our father Jacob saw? What bridge? What connection is there? Some call it a bridge. Some call it a ladder. Some call it a stairway. 
The account is in Genesis 28. And Nathaniel is wondering, what, what bridge, what connection? Seems like heaven is not involved with life on earth. Romans, tyranny, taxes, idolatry, violence. Where is God? And he's crying out to God. Maybe you've done that once or twice. And Nathaniel is going, God, where are you? And do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do you even see me? And no doubt he said that. Do you even see me down here? And he hears a voice calling him, Nathaniel. Maybe for a moment he thought, what? Oh, no, it's just Phil. Phil, he's all excited. And he's running up. We met him. We met the Messiah. Messiah's here. <laughs> And, and Nate is not in the mood for Phil. We met him. He's Messiah. He's Jesus of Nazareth. And Nate goes, are you kidding me? Could anything good come out of Nazareth? In other words, you just said something ridiculous to me, Phil. But Phil does something really smart. Phil just said, come and see. That's pretty smart. Come and see. I'm not going to stand here and argue with you, Nate. I'm not going to make a case. I'm not going to reason with you. I'm just going to invite you to come with me and see. Come and see. <laughs> well, you know what? Nate goes with him. Nate goes with Phil. And as they are approaching, the Son of God, the Son of God goes, now there is a true Israelite, a true son of Israel. Nothing fake in him. And Nathaniel, Nate goes, where do you know me from? <laughs> uh, and the answer from the Son of God blew Nathaniel's mind. Because you know what he said? He said, before Philip found you, under that fig tree, I saw you. <laughs> that is the only way to explain Nathaniel's losing his mind and falling down going, you are the Christ. You are him. You're the, you're the Messiah. King of Israel, you're the son of God. And then the son of God says, oh, Phil, I mean, Nate, you, uh, you believe just because I say I saw you under the fig tree, which I did, hey, you ain't seen nothing yet. He said, you will see heaven open just like Jacob did. And you'll see just like Jacob did, angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That is him, our Lord Jesus, identifying himself as the bridge from heaven to earth. He is the ladder. He's the connection. He is the God-man. He is the bridge from God to man. Do you know him? Do you understand this? Has he captured your heart? Has he completely won you? Has he won your absolute and total allegiance? Your allegiance, your trust, your confidence. Oh, I invite you, friend. If you have never understood just that much about who he is, and now understanding that much, if you've never surrendered your life to him, you ought to, here and now, tonight. Please pray with me right now. Let's pray. Everybody pray with me. Lord in heaven, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to every man, every woman, every child in this room about where they stand with you. Speak to them about who you are and who you have revealed yourself to be. Father, my prayer now is that every single believer in you would be all the more in awe, all the more filled with worship and trust in you. But Father, I pray also for everyone who might be among us right now who has never surrendered their lives to the Lordship of Christ. Lord, I pray you'd open their eyes right now to the reality that you are God and you stepped into history to, to live a sinless life, to die a sacrificial death, and to rise again 
to save us. You died for our sins. Well, I pray, Father, in the name of Christ, that anyone in this room who has never understood that and never put their trust in that before would do it right now. May they hear the voice of the Spirit of God speaking to their heart right now. While the band comes back up, I'm putting this invitation out to all of you. If the Holy Spirit of God is dealing with your heart right now, right now, you know the Lord is calling you to surrender your life to Christ. You're realizing that he dove into the sewage of human guilt. The combined, raw, untreated sewage of all of human history, including your sin. If you're realizing that for the first time, he took it upon himself and he took the punishment upon himself. And that God is calling you to put your trust in Christ. Well, I am talking about you becoming a Christian. Maybe up until now, you've been a church person. You've been a church man or a church woman. You're, you're acquainted with Christ. You know the songs. You know the story. But you've never put your trust in him. Now's the moment. Now's the time. Right now. This is the time for you to step across a line. No longer be a church guy, but to become an actual disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. If the Lord is dealing with your heart, raise your hand right now and say, I need to give my life to him. Put your hand up if that's you. If God is dealing with you, that's, I see you. I see several of you. Come on, put your hand up. If the Lord is calling and you, you know it, it's time for you to surrender your heart to Jesus Christ and receive forgiveness for your sins. Anybody else? Put your hand up if God is dealing with your heart right now. Who else? I see you over there. Midway, in the back. I want to state it again because I'm, I'm so serious about being clear. If you're under conviction from the Holy Spirit and you become conscious that you're just religious, you're just a church guy, but you want to be a disciple, you need to surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Man, woman, if the Lord is dealing with you, if you haven't raised your hand yet, raise your hand right now. Let me see it. Yes, sir. Who else? Looking around the room, I see one man, and I'm, God bless you, man. And another in the back. Two more over here. Who else? Who else is the Lord dealing with? You can put your hand down. You put it up. I see you, man. The Lord saw you. Is there anyone else who would say, me too? Count me in. I want to remove all doubt. I want to be his. He died for me. If that's the case, then I owe him my life. Anybody else want to surrender your life to him tonight? Put your hand up if that's you. Good man. Yes, sir. Okay. Everybody who raised your hand, I want you to stand up. Everybody else just keep praying. If you raised your hand and admitted your need, now stand like a man, like a woman. Stand up. You if you raise your hand and you acknowledged, you got to do it. Now let's do it. Okay, every one of you who are standing, all right, and I know there were more hands that went up. So if you raise your hand, I'm going to say it again. If you raise your hand, now stand up and back up that hand with action. Okay, all of you. With your hands up. Come on, meet me down here. Just, you can, they'll let you out of your aisle. Come meet me down here and let's pray together. Everybody open your eyes and look at these people coming and give them a hand because this is a big deal. A big deal. <clears throat> Come on, man. Brother. Let's pray together. Come on, crowd in, guys. Let's get close. We can do it. We can fit. God bless you. Ruth, God bless you. Name tags are a big deal. I appreciate this. Come right in here. <laughs> God bless you, man. Is it a manly thing? It's a womanly thing you do. Is there any, I'm going to pray with these guys. We're going to receive the Lord. Is there anybody here right now? You're like, man, I should have gone. I'll give you just a few seconds to get up here with them. Anybody here the Lord's dealing with you? You're like, man, I don't want to. Everybody thinks I'm a Christian. No, what does it matter what they think? If you need to admit you've been religious and you need to surrender your heart to Christ, come right now. 
Get going once. Going twice. I don't want to miss you. If you're coming, you better say so. Okay. Are you coming for that very purpose? Are you too? Oh, that's good. Camera guy. Oh, now look at this. See? You see, you, you have to check because not everybody responds immediately. Some are reluctant. <laughs> Come on, man. God bless. Oh, this is good. Come on, girl. We're going to pray together. Just repeat this prayer, but it's going to be from your heart. You've already made the statement. Friends, you made the statement when you raised your hand and when you came up here. But let's just let's formalize it with a prayer. Say this to the Lord. You say, Lord, I am a sinner. I admit it. And you are right. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead. And in his name, I ask you to forgive me for all my sin. And I give you my life. I am yours now forever. Your will prevail in my life. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change me forever. I'm yours. Amen. Amen, ladies and gentlemen. Turn around and look at these guys. Turn around and look at everybody. Come on, everybody. Hey, don't go anywhere yet. Come on. Everybody stand up and give them a standing ovation. Hey, let's, before we sing, everybody that's near enough, reach up here and put a hand on these people. No slapping foreheads, no pushing foreheads, no tipping people. Just a gentle brotherly hand, a sisterly hand on the shoulder. Come on up. Some of you guys in the front, come on up here. Lay hands on these guys. Let's pray. The Lord will fill him with his spirit. Oh, Father, in the name of Christ, this whole church family prays. Receive these according to your very promise, and may they never be the same. Fill them with you. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Be their Father in heaven from this day forward. In the name of Jesus Christ, our King, Lord, we love you because you have loved us and you love them. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Welcome to the family. <laughs>